حضورنا الكريم جلستنا القادمة ستكون باللغة الإنجليزية Our coming session will be in English في جلستنا الرابعة وعنوانها القيادة المدرسية المرنة والمبتكرة خارطة عفوا خارطة طريق للمستقبل سنتعرف بشكل أكبر عن القيادة المدرسية التي تدعم أولياء الأمور وستدير هذه الجلسة الأستاذة فرحة نسا نسوشن مدير مشروع في أد هيروز آسيا ومقدم أخبار في شبكة سي أن أن أندونيسيا That is very true caring for yourself for your own mental health and well-being is the foundation. Thank you, Dr. Sena and the panelists for an inspiring session. Dear attendees, our next session will be in English. In the next session entitled Agile and Innovative School Leadership, the Roadmap, the Roadmap for the Future, we will learn more about equitable school leadership and inclusive leadership that supports parents and families. Moderating this session is Ms. Farhanisa Nasushin, Project Chairwoman at Ed Heroes Asia and News Anchor for CNN Indonesia. Welcome, Ms. Farhanisa. Hello, thank you very much. And good evening, Jakarta time and good afternoon, Jordan time. How are you? All right. Good, Hello, thank good you. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Far uh, Ms. Mar Farhanisa. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This is an honor for me to be here, and thank you very much. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Start, yes. Before we start our session, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Farhanisa Nasution. I am the project chairwoman of Ed Heroes Asia. Little background about us is we, the Ed Heroes Network, emerged to support families and increase access to quality education for everyone. Our mission is to unite, support, and inspire families around the world by providing access to quality education. And on this joyous occasion, we would like to thank Queen Brania Teacher Academy for having us at this distinguished forum, the QRTA Forum 2022. So ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to talk about agile and innovative school leadership, the roadmap for the future. It has long been clear that an effective educational leader needs to bring many and varied skills to the task at hand, such as the ability to communicate effectively, to organize, to collaborate, to unify, and to promote growth. But as we have learned during the pandemic, one of the most important skills is agility, the ability to adapt on the ever-changing circumstances. In society broadly and the education sector specifically, uh, the nature of the landscape has definitely shifted. With respect to leadership in schools and systems, provincially, nationally, and internationally, the organizational terrain has evolved because of the extraordinary experiences of the pandemic period and is not likely to return to the well-worn physical features of the past. Leaders, as a result, also have to adopt an innovative, in inventive mindset, understanding and supporting the needs of students, as well as educators, in order to create the best possible learning environment. And the question would be, how can the, they best prepare their teachers and students for such an eventuality? And also, how can everybody, in fact, ensure that the best systems and procedures are in place. We are going to discuss it further with our experts, panelists for today. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Alexander W. Wiseman from Texas Tech University, USA. We also have Dr. Jason G. Irizarry from University of Connecticut, USA. And we also have Dr. Ayman Mazuti from Abu Dhabi University. We are going to start um, our panel today with um, from Dr. Alex. Dr. Alex, um, regarding our topic today, so we do really uh, know and we do well aware of that a lot of um, factors uh, could contribute to agile and innovative school leadership. One of them is comparative data. And how can school leaders use comparative data to make innovative decisions and lead change? Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, 
just having me here. It's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, event and to uh, get to be, I got to listen in on some of the previous uh, session as well. So it's a wonderful, wonderful event. And uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, school leadership and change with everyone today. So how can school leaders use comparative data to make uh, either innovative decisions or lead change is, uh, is sort of, I think the question. And I'll start by saying that innovation and change often begin with a comparative examination of what other schools or systems or teachers or leaders are doing. And that focus is typically on those that achieve at high levels or create something unique to their own context or their situation. So it's, it's kind of natural to compare. And as a result, comparison among school leaders, unfortunately, is often unplanned or it's taken for granted. It can be something that we, we've done sort of naturally for, you know, throughout our lives and our careers, and it's certainly fundamental to understanding, but it really deserves, I think, more of a, a purposeful approach. So one of the first things that school leaders can do is to really decide what comparative data or comparative information they want to use. That can be in the form of student achievement scores. It could be descriptions of programs or projects. It could be mandated professional development or reports from the ministry or department of education. I mean, there, there are a lot of different ways that you can go with the data. Uh, one of the directions that many leaders go is by using student outcomes or student achievement. I'm not saying that's the best way or always the right way, but it's a frequent way. Uh, but the data could be numerical or it could be anecdotal. In my experience and the research that I've been doing for uh, a long time, suggests that there are two factors that are really key to using comparative data. Uh, one is context and one is the unit of comparison. So innovative change arises in specific contexts. So it's imperative for school leaders to understand the context where they make decisions and where they lead change. And I know this might seem obvious because everyone believes that they know their own community and their own context, but I wanna be specific about the kinds of characteristics of the context that um, are really crucial to making uh, comparative data-driven decisions. First, you have to clearly articulate what you're trying to accomplish. You can't just start with the data. You have to know why you're using the data. So articulating what you're trying to accomplish as a school leader and making it as narrow and focused as possible so that you can really address it is the, is the first, and I think one of the most important steps. Second, you have to identify what good, better, and best look like. Make it specific to what you're trying to accomplish. Make it a smart goal if you, if you want, you know, S-M-A-R-T, those kinds of goals. Third, you need to clearly define the scope of your authority to make decisions and implement change. Now, if you're a, if you're a school campus leader, that scope of authority is probably the school campus and, and things that happen within that building. But it might extend beyond that, or it might be a, a more narrow focus within that. But the most important, and this is the fourth part of the context, is to take an inventory of the infrastructure, which is materials, funding, content, personnel, or other resources. Take an inventory of the capacity. That refers to the knowledge and skills that are relevant to your goal or your behavior or your outcomes or whatever it is. And then take an inventory of the stakeholders that you have, those that are uh, part of the um, the, the school who have a vested interest in the outcomes of the school, those could be parents. Um, usually that means that these stakeholders are probably the target population of whatever the decision or the innovation is. And then using this information, you can be begin by comparing the outcomes of whatever the units within your scope of authority are, We're, I'm using the school as an example. And these, these first comparisons would be internal comparisons. So if your scope is a school campus, then you begin by comparing one classroom to another. If your scope's an educational district, then you might compare one school to another. So note the differences in outcomes among those units within your scope of authority. Are they doing good, better, or best compared to each other? And then you, you wanna see how do they vary from each other based on infrastructure capacity or stakeholder influence. The next step is to compare the outcomes of your unit, whatever your scope of authority applies to with others under your own umbrella of supervision or regulation. These are your partner comparisons. So if you're a school within, let's say, a district, then you'd compare across schools. And then finally, you want to identify units that resemble your own 
that are beyond your immediate community, but are achieving whatever the outcome is that you're interested in at the highest level. And those are the target comparisons. So you wanna see how do they compare to you in terms of infrastructure capacity and stakeholder influence, as well as you know, do they match in terms of their outcomes? If you follow those, those steps, I think that you're on a good step to use comparative data to make innovative decisions and lead change. Yeah, so regarding to this, that we should really decide on which metrics the, we could use, and we should also identify what uh, we are going to use, especially when it comes to um, comparing outcomes and talking about outcomes, uh, Dr. Alex, um, we would like to know more about what are some characteristics of equitable school readership and how does it campus level teacher and student outcomes? Yeah, great question. So equitable school leadership, I think, follows really closely on how using comparative data, because one of the first steps to um, sort of implementing equitable school leadership begins with a comparative analysis, like trying to understand, first of all, who are the different groups of learners that you have in your school or in your educational community? So you, you have to identify that first. And that you can identify groups of learners around many different characteristics. Um, some frequent characteristics are race, socioeconomic status, gender, ethnicity, language, religion, special education needs. I mean, the list can go on and on. It really would depend on what the particular community's um, demographics are and what that community is, is, is focused on. Um, but you have to be aware of that. So that's, that's number one. And that's, that's sort of the building block of the, of the comparison as well. But I also would argue, well, I don't argue, I'm going to say <laughs> that equitable school leadership typically begins with some sort of an equity audit. Um, so you do an equity audit for your, your school or whatever, you know, unit educational system you're interested in. And that's where you start the equitable school leadership comparison uh, among those groups of learners. Uh, when, you, when you do that, uh, again, the first step is to use the data or evidence that you have to identify where equity gaps are. So data that's often used in equity audits could include um, just anything that identifies who these groups of learners are in terms of their demographics and characteristics. You can also look at data that um, is addressing student outcomes. Usually that's you know, grades or achievement scores. You can look at graduation rates or retention and attrition. You can look at discipline rates. That's a big one here in the States, uh, looking at differences among groups based on uh, discipline and especially exclusionary discipline. You can look at enrollment in like honors courses or AP courses or that sort of thing, extracurricular participation. I mean, the, the list again can go on and on, but you need to identify the kinds of um, you know, uh, outcomes that are most demonstrable of equity uh, in your community. And I've given you some examples just, just there. The next step, uh, again, I would suggest that uh, as part of this equity audit uh, to incorporate the comparison that I just explained in, in response to your first question. But um, once you do that, um, a great way to start to think about what equitable school leadership is, is to focus on sort of three big areas um, as a school leader and, and how you can um, you know, uh, both identify the gaps in equity, but also build structures for providing more equitable education. And those three areas are access and infrastructure. Infrastructure is very similar to what I just talked about with comparison. Um, the second area is achievement and accountability. Uh, and the third area is opportunity to learn. So just having access to school is actually a really important part. And depending on where you are in the world and what kind of community you're in, and certainly during COVID, this was a huge issue, um, just having access, like being able to participate in formal schooling is a very big deal. Even when schools are open, access to education can be limited for certain groups. So you want to see who can make it there. And then once they make it there, thinking about the infrastructure, do all groups of students have equitable access to resources, including funding, staffing, facilities, instructional materials, equipment, other sorts of things. The second area is achievement and accountability. You certainly wanna look at, at like academic outcomes, um, but you also wanna think about uh, other kinds of outcomes that would be, again, related to graduation or retention and attrition or discipline or those sorts of things. 
And the accountability part is making sure that stakeholders hold themselves and each other responsible for the success of every student. And I keep using these terms like equitable and every and all, um, which I, I know are kind of generic and bland, but it really does depend on your, your situation. So where I'm sitting in the United States right now, uh, probably the biggest equity issues we have in our schools revolve around the intersection of race and socioeconomic status. We have big, big equity gaps there. So if I was doing this for my local community, those would be the things I'd be looking at. And then I'd be addressing these all these factors related to that. And then finally, opportunity to learn really has to do with, do you have the opportunity for a welcoming and inclusive learning environment? Is there an academic setting with high standards and the kinds of supports that are necessary? And it's the responsibility of school leaders to provide an equitable education for all the students, regardless of their backgrounds, um, in, their, in their schools or their school districts. So if you, if you can manage these things, and I know I'm giving the sort of, you know, 10,000 foot view of this, but if you can manage these things, outcomes of equitable school leadership can be, you know, not only better and appropriate support for students during daily instruction, but also support for students when they make sort of key transitions or milestone moments. Often an area where we see inequity rear its ugly head is at transition moments, like from primary to secondary school, or from uh, you know, a certain type of scheduling to another type of scheduling, or even transitions that might occur within the school day, like from class to lunch and back. Uh, you'll see all sorts of interactions and behaviors happen during those milestone moments. And usually, if you have equitable school leadership, there's going to be support and there's going to be engagement um, at those moments. We also would want to see equity awareness among the, the staff and the educators that are working in the schools. So this isn't just uh, only focused on, on the students, but it's also focused on equity and awareness among the educators themselves. So having a, a strong professional uh, development uh, of program will be important. And then finally, I'd say a, a really important part of equitable school leadership is the creation of some sort of a a, a systems, uh, a feedback system for ongoing accountability and improvement, because uh, chances are, even if you make a change initially, eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve or change or deteriorate so that it's going to have to be updated or the context is going to change or something else along the way. Again, that was really sky high. So um, happy to answer questions about that. Yeah, because from the term that you choose, it's equitable school leadership. Uh, we do, uh, from your explanations, that we could learn that a lot of factors uh, are contributing to that. And um, one of them is having access to quality education uh, and opportunity, also support, and also the creation of feedback system and accountability improvements is crucial to have uh, a balance uh, or should we say a good equitable school leadership uh, as an outcome. And this brings us to another um, speakers, Dr. Jason. So uh, as Dr. Alex mentioned, uh, one of the um, important part of ensuring an equitable school leadership is the, um, the uh, leaders uh, role in it. And uh, talking about leaders, leaders as a result also have to adapt to an innovative and inventive mindset and how leaders should be also proactive uh, to address wider demographics of teachers and students because one nation compared to another nation is not, uh, is not apple to apple at times. So how do we tackle this issue, sir? Sure. So, so thank you again. It's really absolute pleasure to be here with all of you uh, in this conversation that I think is so important and timely. So, uh, obviously, I work in a in a U.S. context where, um, you know, we we have to think really deeply about attracting people to education related professions. So, uh, I think we we have done a real disservice, particularly to the teaching profession, um, and it has lost a significant amount of prestige. We know that, you know, particularly in the United States context, you know, many folks go into teaching, um, not so much for the extrinsic rewards, uh, but more so for the intrinsic rewards. And we've made it really difficult and we're hemorrhaging teachers. Uh, if you look in, you know, national news, right, we constantly have bombarded with stories about teacher shortages, uh, et cetera. And so I think it's, it's really important um, that we think about 
this not only uh, as a, a personnel issue, but really as an equity issue, right? So what districts are most likely to be impacted negatively, right? It's those that serve students that come from communities that have historically and continue to be underserved by schools. And so um, within the, the NEAG school community where I'm at the University of Connecticut, um, we're trying to be really proactive um, to combat demographic shifts as well in our state where the number of um, the student population is actually declining. And so making, you know, when you have a declining student population and then you have, a, you know, professions that aren't as attractive as they have been in years past, it really portends a pessimistic fate. Um, and so we're trying to be really proactive to do some work to um, one, demystify the college going process to make the University of Connecticut and other you know, higher ed institutions as well, uh, a, a reality for, for young people, particularly those that um, come from, from homes where they might be the first in their family to attempt to go to college. Um, and then um, we're trying to also demystify what it means to do college level work. And so within the NEAC school, we have uh, uh, partnered with the university's Office of Early College Experience to offer three college courses to high school students so that they can do some career exploration around um, education related pathways. Um, and then hopefully some of those students will show up um, you know, at our doors and be prepared to become teachers and counselors, school psychologists, sport management professionals uh, in the future. But if we're not really proactive and looking at this as a real equity issue, um, you know, it, it really, is not going to, to work out well um, for our nation's schools and for our institutions of higher education. Yeah, it is a very interesting point that you made. Uh, so not only in the US, apparently from my country, which is the Indonesia, we also experienced a nearly similar experience where, where young people tend not to choose a teacher, for example, as a, their professions. And this is very interesting because there are uh, certain shifts and certain changes that is currently uh, happening uh, within the youth. And how do you see the roles of leaders uh, to reduce this shift? Uh, and also, uh, since I'm also a media practitioner and working as a CN uh, an anchor for a CNN, so uh, how do you see the role of media to uh, push this issue, yeah. sir? So I think we have we have a dominant narrative that's perpetuated at least in part by the media. Um, I won't I won't lay it all there, but um, we have this dominant narrative about the landscape of education. So like in the U.S. right now, you know there are a lot. There's a big push to to narrow curricular focus, um, banning certain books, and you know making making the landscape really unattractive for young people kind of, you know, looking out when they, they see stories about schools, they're typically largely negative and not necessarily, um, you know, underscoring a lot of the positive aspects of the work. So obviously every profession has challenges and, and education related professions are, are no different, but I don't think that we do enough in promoting a counter narrative, right? So really authentic, factual stories uh, about folks that are really fulfilled in their work as teachers and schools that are doing amazing work, even in the face of really difficult circumstances. Those schools that are, um, you know, finding success, serving some of the most vulnerable, you know, communities among us. And so I think, you know, we have a job as educational leaders, and I think certainly can be bolstered by the media to kind of recapture the narrative around education and and really highlighting. Um, it as a field for people who are intellectually curious, who are passionate about serving other folks, um, you know, who really are interested in shaping the minds of the future, right? And, and, and empowering young people to, to reach their personal and academic potential. So I think, you know, right now, this is a really challenging time for us, but I think a significant um, role for educational leaders is try to, to craft a counter narrative that's based on authentic stories going on and work using whatever platforms they have to try to, to really underscore that, that counter narrative and make the, make the profession attractive again. 
That's a very interesting point that you made, Dr. Jason. So uh, we have a saying in the media, whoever control the narrative, control everything. So that's also the case with this, uh, where we need to recapture the narrative and also uh, have a dominate narrative, uh, the landscape about education. And also we also need to create some counter narrative about that. Thank you very much, Dr. Jason. So yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Ayman, uh, since we're talking about the leaders and how they uh, their role is so important, so integral and crucial within the world of education, how do you see a current inclusion policies inform the leadership practices in schools? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me also in this uh, forum. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, a lot of uh, professionals and experts in, in this field. Actually, the, the work of inclusion policies and leadership, of course, still also resonate with lots of the information that shared by Dr. Arizan and Dr. Jason as well. Because currently now talking about the inclusion policies that actually continue to develop on a daily basis and try to respond to this ongoing international call to bring equity access for all learners uh, in different school contexts. The point here is that we are, uh, looking into this kind of relation between the inclusion policies and the leadership practices. Uh, actually, these policies, when they are crafted or designed or developed by the policymakers, they, they are also intended to assist school leaders and education professionals to design learning that is accessible. I'm, I'm meaning here by education professionals, also teachers. So everyone in the school community, in a sense, in a way or another, is also connected to those policies being written and described and designed in order really yeah, to bring as much as possible uh, uh, an accessible education, education that is really responsive to students' diverse needs. However, school leaders now and their associations, the people they work with actually are, it uh, seems to be getting caught into what's, what we call now organizational challenges that render the implementation of those policies little possible. So now here, of course, we are attributing to the professional skills, for example, for inclusion among educators that really address in the literature and different studies about inclusion and lack also of necessary resources to establish a real inclusive classroom. Because we may have students in the classroom, they are expected to be included. However, they are excluded within their own classroom. Just because of, again, the lack of resources and the lack of support, the lack of teaching assistance that across the globe, we tend to have this problem and we are still facing it today. Also lack of materials, the needed, those needed for special instruction, like assistive technology devices, for example, and lack of inclusive mindsets as well. So it's not only the material element, but also the psycho uh, element, the social, the social emotional as well, the experiences of those working under the umbrella of inclusive education, because now every educator is expected to be an inclusive educator, right? Now people are moving from one uh, place to another uh, at a higher rate than before because of traveling, right? And people are relocating because of war, because of different issues happening around the globe. So we get to see the demographics of our classrooms changing on a daily basis. So you get to see many people from different backgrounds, social, cultural, etc. as the list goes, as Dr. Alexander mentioned. So we have a lot of uh, changes happening on a daily basis and policies need also to resonate with this. We need also policies to adapt to this and get modified and adjusted according to the needs of the school communities today. That said, of course, it's significant to call them on school leaders who are attending with us here, or for those who may not be, and maybe you can transfer the message to them, that we need to revisit those practices performed in our schools and pay further attention to what is really needed and what is more pressing than before in order to really ensure there is equity access. We cannot, of course, be ideal and try to sugarcoat things. There are a lot of issues. Every school has its own issues and problems, depending again on the context they are in. However, we need to turn this dialogue into more serious dialogue with the local governing institutions on the challenges of inclusion. So we need to bring more people to the table, I believe. We cannot just take these policies from the ministry or the institution or the governing authority of education and just put it there in the drawer and nobody actually knows about it. Because look at, at the literature, when you ask pre-service teachers and in-service teachers about those inclusion policies, many of them tell you, we don't know about them. We haven't read them. We, we just hear from maybe the principal or the vice principal talking about these, but did they actually engage uh, 
well with these documents to, re to really identify what's expected from them as professionals, what these leaders are also expected to do based on those policies, they to create their own internal policies based on those macro policies for inclusion. However, challenges are there. So perhaps we can seek maybe development of special funds, I would say, in order to really support the implementation of such policies. And these funds maybe can be utilized to provide like enhanced inclusive education programs and services and really develop like a shared resource hub, I would say. I love this concept of shared resource hub for inclusion. So uh, like establishing a network. Networking is very significant right now, especially given the technology that we have right now. So we can easily connect with any school, with any uh, principal across the, the nations, across countries as well to really support. And maybe thinking now from a local perspective within our own communities, we can have that network where uh, private and public if possible, institutions or schools can share facilities. Uh, I mean by facilities here, the human resources, material resources, what is available for us to really support students in school A and students in school B who are struggling with inclusion to really uh, bring kind of a relief for teachers who are not having access to enough resources to support the students they have in those schools. So, uh, so, so this could be one significant approach or one recommendation, I would say. Back to the main idea also of the question, uh, these current policies that we have across different education systems across the globe are indeed, see, providing the roadmap. They provide us with a roadmap as school leaders or as teachers on the criteria of inclusive schools. They give us the blueprint of what is expected and what needs to be done. However, the reality that we are hearing from people around us, because we're all in the education sector here, it's really far from those discourses that are embedded in these policies. So there is kind of a gap. There is a big space between those policy developers or makers in the macro system and those who are implementers of the policy at the micro level system. We need to shrink this distance between them in order to really have a group of people working together because inclusion by default is a collaborative practice. I cannot be myself alone in the realm of inclusive education. I need people to be working with me, whether I'm a leader or a school teacher or head of department, regardless. So we need to come together and really stand on what works and what's not in those schools when it comes to inclusive education and what needs to be done moving forward in this regard. So there is a lot of work to do, I would say. Again, just to kind of collectively uh, bring the point again, the core idea is that we need a really a serious dialogue between all people involved because we continue to face this issue of resources, these issues of challenges that I don't have. We don't have enough. We don't have teaching us. We don't have uh, enough funding to provide the materials. So why then schools are accepting students if they are not able actually to support them? Why don't we engage other institutions, other maybe charitable organizations into the, the work of those schools in order to support and support people in order to actually bring the best they can about inclusive education? And in particular, since we are talking about leadership, leaders, let's support leaders as much as possible because at the end of the day, they depend on what they have, right? In order to provide the best they can. So, so the hope is, 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 is big that we are able to bring about change when we continue to communicate and really bring uh, a new definition for inclusive education in our schools. Yeah, so uh, when we are talking about the uh, policy, um, policy also needs to accommodate a lot of changes that's currently happening. So it needs to be inclusive. And um, in regarding to that uh, matters, uh, in what ways uh, do you see uh, can inclusive leadership support parents and families of people of determination? Yes, yeah, see, this is this is also a hot topic in the context of the UAE, where I'm based right now, because see, inclusive leadership practice, whenever we say inclusive leadership, we're we are attributing to the concept of care, concept of welcoming environment in schools, uh, equity access, uh, support, treating all members of the school community and in terms of equality and equity, right? Tr trying to really create that sense of culture where every member feels included. Every member of the school community feels that they belong. I'm meaning here people of all diverse needs, not necessarily those 
with the special education needs that we call them in the UAE student of determination or in the context of society, people of determination, because we are looking into the strength of those people right now in the context of UAE, you see? So this surely means like we are also need, in need of uh, investing in resources that particular groups, in this case, the student of determination need to access the school curriculum, need to be able to reach their full potential. Uh, shedding light on the parents themselves of student determination, many of them actually, according to research done in the local communities here across different institutions and by local researchers in the UAE about inclusive education in the UAE, parents are finding themselves overwhelmed by significant financial barriers because uh, school fees for private quality education, and every parent, of course, wants to uh, have the best education for, for their children, right? So they try to maybe choose the best school possible for, for their kids. And I think everybody aspires for this. But what's, what's happening is that those parents are finding themselves in need to pay more money to hire uh, shadow teachers, to hire uh, a specialist school. This the kids in the school on top of the high school fees. So some parents ending up saying, I can't. I'm already paying too much for the school, the regular school fees. Now, just because I have a child with a special education need or uh, student determination, I have to now pay a lot of money extra just to support him and find the space for him in the school. So this is creating kind of a burden on, for the parents. So what is possible to be done here? We're just like trying to maybe share thoughts and ideas on how can we really support those parents to, to again, bring relief to them and help them to, to be able to actually have a chance for their kids rather than thinking about, you know what, I want just to immigrate. I want to go to Canada or US because I know those countries, they really support people of determination and students with special education needs in terms of education services and assessment strategies and all different kind of support. So why not in our local context, we also try to find something that we can uh, help those parents to feel relief. So perhaps again, uh, thinking of, again of the issue of funding, like funding private schools, uh, not necessarily 100% funding, but also thinking about other organizations that used to maybe fund other institutions. Why don't we add schools to the list as well by other maybe non-government organizations or again, charity organizations that they support different issues in society, add schools to the list, add the schools that support students with determination or students with special needs. Why don't we also bring more funds to those and create something like special education fund for private schools? And the point of it is just to support parents who really can't pay in order to have their child educated in that school. So this could be one of the solution. And of course, thinking about how can uh, the public and the private work together? Because no one will, will doubt that private education at the end of the day as a business industry, right? But at the end of the day, we cannot just penalize parents because of this. Thinking about private education, their fees are high and uh, they already have money. So why should we support? The support is for the parents at the end of the day. The parents already are being asked to pay too much money for their uh, education, for their kids, but they need support. If we can provide from different resources, from different channels to support those parents, I think, uh, it will really reflect uh, th that kind of shared commitment of all societal uh, sectors towards the people of determination. And of course, in particular, uh, the students of determination in the context of the UAE and I think the region. So the, let's hope. Yeah, sure. L let's hope for the best. And because uh, we are talking about uh, how then uh, we need to invest on the people to ensure they could reach their full potential. And also uh, we need to uh, be able to help parents and families to be able uh, for them to get to be able to get access to education. Uh, one of them is funding uh, private schools for perhaps, uh, but then again, uh, we are still um, open about a lot of uh, options when it comes to supporting people. So we have uh, United in Diversity. Um, so all of us, uh, stakeholders, teachers, parents, uh, educators need to come as one to ensure the best um, 
outcomes for agile and innovative school leadership because this is uh, the future we are creating the future by what we are doing now so uh, once again thank you very much for all panelists for today dr alexander w Wiseman from the texas tech university usa dr jason g irizari from the university of connecticut usa and dr ayman masuti from the Abu Dhabi University UAE. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this fruitful session. We do hope that uh, it could have a lot of uh, more knowledge, new knowledge and impact to everyone uh, that is here right now. So good afternoon from Indonesia. And back to you, 